Now we're going to talk about projectile motion as an example of 2D motion. Now we're going to be making it a little more complicated by actually thinking about air resistance because without air resistance it's actually fairly simple. You hopefully realize that there is no force acting in the x direction, the horizontal direction, since the acceleration there is zero. So if we want to think about it with air resistance, now we might have to think about forces acting in two directions. So the nice thing about perfect projectile-like motion, where we get to say that air resistance is zero, that this actually, I can't spell, air resistance, this actually is a model for many types of two-dimensional motion, where you only have to worry about your acceleration in one dimension because you have uniform motion in the other. So linear motion, which is what we talked about before, one component of the acceleration is always zero. And that's again something like the acceleration perpendicular to a ramp. So if our accelerations are independent, meaning that the acceleration in the x direction and the y direction have nothing to do with each other, or specifically don't depend on each other, aren't related in any way, then we just get to break it up like we have for projectile motion. Now I'm going to talk about a situation where that's not true, but an example where that is true is what we actually did with the rocket in the wind in the previous video, that you had a y force from the rocket and an x force from the wind, and those were two independent forces. They weren't related. So if you wanted to calculate something, you could calculate what happens in Y and what happens in X independently, the way that you've been used to doing that for projectile motion. So now let's add drag to projectile motion. And in this case, we mean air resistance. Now back in chapter four, I think, there was some chapter where the equation for air resistance or specifically drag in general was introduced. We didn't go into it, so I'm still not going to go into it, but I want you to be able to qualitatively think through the impact that this is going to have. So I have to tell you a few things if you don't already know them, and again it's okay if you don't since we more or less skipped this portion of, of the chapter since it's not one of the important ones. So air resistance as a force depends on the speed that the object is going. So think about that. This is not going to be a constant force. Constant forces are something like the force of gravity that doesn't care how fast you're going. But air resistance specifically depends on the velocity. So that's one thing to think about. That's clearly going to make it more complicated. The next thing is that the direction is opposite the direction of the velocity at that moment in time. So you know for normal projectile motion without any air resistance that the direction the object is traveling is varying with time. Your x component of the velocity is constant, but your y component is changing so that your velocity vector is constantly changing in direction. So this means that the force of air resistance is also going to be changing in direction if your velocity is changing in direction. So we've said from this first part that we know that the magnitude of the force is actually changing in time since we said that the air resistance depends on the speed that the object is going and we know that the speed is changing with time. And we know that the direction is changing in time since the direction depends on uh, the velocity. So this is where these are the two things I was telling you, these are the conclusions we can come to, that the force is constantly changing in both speed and direction. So something that's a little tricky to see is that the forces now in x and y are not going to be independent. And the reason for that is that if we imagine that the force is acting perfectly in the x direction, which it isn't, but let's simplify, and it depends on the speed that the object is going. The speed depends on both Vx, right? Vx and Vy. So our speed depends both on what's happening in x and what's happening in y. Now the direction also is going to depend, right? If we think about the direction of velocity, that's also going to depend on what your Vx is doing, that was a terrible triangle, and your Vy. So 
the speed has both vx and vy, the direction has both vx and vy. So that means that the force acting on our particle is going to have a component both in x and y, and the calculation of how strong that force is and what direction it points in depends both on x and y. So we can't just say that what's happening in x has nothing to do with y and vice versa. This is a big problem. This is beyond the scope of what is solvable in intro physics. It is actually solvable, but not without higher level math. And in general, the technique you would use to solve something like this is to basically use a computer. So we're not going to go into this with detail. And that's part of why that I'm not, this is part of why I'm not going into air resistance, the calculation of it in detail, because we can't actually get very far with it before we hit the point where we can't actually do the calculation. So hopefully you can think through though, if you threw a ball and air resistance was sizable, that the direction and force of that air resistance force is constantly changing, totally making it impossible to calculate, but also really changing what our trajectories look like. So this is a plot from the book talking about what it's going to look like now as you shoot it at different angles. Now note that now our maximum is not 45 degrees anymore. It used to be the case that 30 and 60 degrees would get you to the same point and 45 was the max. Now that's not the case. And to calculate this, they've had to assume a specific mass of the ball and properties of it to actually calculate drag, which again is just air resistance here. So you can see that the shapes don't look like um, parabolas. Like the 61 looks a little bit like a parabola, but it's still shifted a little bit. And what's happening is that your y component and x component of the velocity are shrinking this entire time because air resistance is opposing it. And again, it, those velocity values, especially in your x, is still decreasing. And in your y, you then have to just know the difference between the force of gravity and acting in the y and the component of your uh, air resistance acting in the y. So calculating these shapes are way beyond what we can do in the class, but you can see that it looks very different from projectile motion when air resistance was negligible. So Again, this is two-dimensional motion, thinking about forces in 2D, but this is the crazy hard situation where the forces in X and the forces in Y are related to one another and we can't do any further simplification. So to summarize, uh, Newton's laws still work in two dimensions. Again, that's a really simple question to answer and because we defined Newton's second law originally as vectors, of course it's true. Now, whenever you're now working in two dimensions, please be careful to distinguish between the force vector and your force components. And that's true either for force and acceleration. Um, so please be careful, those notations really matter. Are you talking about something that has a magnitude and a direction, or are you only talking about a magnitude? So whenever we have forces that are perpendicular to the velocity vector at that moment in time that is changing a direction forces parallel to the velocity vector change the speed and this is again coming from what we already defined with acceleration back in chapter four so if you want to know where this math comes from go back and review chapter four lastly projectile motion with the force of air resistance is basically impossible especially at this level in the class and one thing to think about is now the force is not constant it's depending very much on the speed and the xy components of the force are not independent from one another so anytime that you do have independent forces i.e. a fixed force in x and a fixed force in y, you can totally solve that. You could also solve a problem where the forces are changing in x and y but aren't related to one another. So we're going to be looking now after this in future videos at some situations where the forces in x and y are related but we just use a different coordinate system to simplify the problem.